Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Suberna, and I'm so happy to welcome you all to the fourth annual Cannabis in Practice webinar series hosted by the Washington County Health Department in partnership with the Washington County Medical Society. This virtual series is aimed towards healthcare providers with the goal of raising awareness and opening discussions surrounding cannabis use for medical practices. Our speakers come from a wide range of backgrounds and are experts in their respective fields related to medical cannabis. Funding for this series comes from the Michigan Department of Licensing and Regula Regulatory Affairs, Cannabis Regulatory Agency. I'm pleased to introduce today's speaker, Grant Richardson. Grant Richardson is an educator, entrepreneur, and social justice warrior. Grant serves as vice president and partner at Illinois Cannabis Training Center. He is an organizer working closely with leaders at the Cannabis Equity Illinois Coalition and Chicago Normal. He works as a facilitator for national workshops on topics of social entrepreneurship, cannabis justice, community building, storytelling, and more. His focus is to increase access to opportunities to create wealth and advance wellness in cannabis for Black and brown communities. Thank you so much, Grant, again, for joining us today, and I'll let you take it away. Hello. Good morning, you all, or good afternoon, wherever you are in the world. I'm super excited to uh, be joining this space today uh, with much gratitude to uh, Sabarna for that introduction uh, and the whole Washington County Health Department team and the Washington, Washington County Medical Society uh, for bringing this event together and just creating the space for us to share in conversation and discussion uh, that can allow us all to uh, think really critically about making sure this cannabis industry is something that uh, is reflective of what we know is what's best for our communities. So with that, uh, as Subarna mentioned, my name is Grant Richardson, and today I'm going to be leading us through a presentation on medicinal cannabis and social equity for this Cannabis in Practice webinar series. All right, so first, just some pictures, uh, just remember like what we're here talking about, right? We're brought here today because this plant, which has incredible medicinal properties, recreational properties, spiritual properties, was has been recently legalized. And over the course of the last few years, um, we're seeing legalization expand rapidly. And so there's a lot of opportunity that's being created by that. And who is that actually, who is that opportunity accessible to? Uh, especially since we know the legacy uh, of the years of criminalization that has existed around this plant, some of which we'll talk through today. So with that, just to share with you a little bit more about who I am, my name is Grant Richardson. I am one of the co-founders of Illinois Cannabis Training Center. We work closely in Illinois with the Department of Financial and Professional Regulation, providing the uh, state-approved compliance training, but broadly lead efforts related to making sure our community is aware of opportunities being created by cannabis and positioned with proximity to the resources needed to access them. I do a lot of community organizing and am very involved. Um, my passion really is social justice and economic empowerment of Black and Brown communities. And so I do some of that work when, in the cannabis industry through the Cannabis Equity Illinois Coalition and the Chicago Normal, which are in different ways centering disproportionately impacted folks. Uh, but I also do that outside of the cannabis industry in spaces uh, pertaining to early childhood um, and youth entrepreneurship. It tends to all revolve around entrepreneurship and social entrepreneurship, and in some way, shape, or form, the bottom line for me is how are we making sure that we're addressing inequity that is based ultimately upon aspects of identity that are out of our control, um, namely race, geography, zip code, um, gender, sexual orientation, whatever you may have it. How can we address these inequities and how can social entrepreneurship be a tool uh, to advance us toward that. So we'll be talking a lot about that today because one of the big questions that I've been exploring since I joined the cannabis industry years back is this question of how are the benefits of medicinal cannabis improving disproportionately impacted communities to the greatest extent possible? This is the question that we're going to be talking around um, and about today with different considerations too. And in order to really discuss that question, we're going to walk through the presentation objectives that are on your screen uh, before you. So first, we'll start with just grounding ourselves in the what and the why behind social equity advocacy, looking at a little bit of language to then make the and then moving into um, some analysis of the data present and historical to understand the legacy of this industry and current dynamics that make the case for the why behind social equity advocacy. 
We'll look at some of what these efforts to advance restorative justice and social equity through medicinal cannabis have actually looked like in communities in Illinois and Michigan. We'll look at some of the barriers that exist to actually accessing these benefits and advancing social equity efforts through cannabis. And then finally, we'll do some grounding in uh, steps toward uh, really uh, uh, um, creating a shared vision with those who are in who you are in community with regarding what social equity efforts look like and how they can be advanced through medicinal cannabis, because ultimately we know with this type of work, it takes a hyper-local approach. You know the dynamics within your community. You know the local decision makers and stakeholders that need to be at the table. And so only with a local understanding and by bringing in local stakeholders and aligning with them and creating a shared vision, can we really move forward with intentional, meaningful, impactful change at the grassroots level. All right. So a few agreements before we dive into the meat and bones of the presentation. I ask you all to engage. I see some folks jumping into the chat already. I got the chat up here. Um, I see Jamel in the chat with a heart and um, Ariane sharing some links. So I'm going to be in the chat. So I invite you all to engage there with me and with the group. I ask you to always ask. So if you have any questions throughout this time, make sure to put that in the chat. We'll be collecting them toward the end of the presentation for the Q&A portion of this event. Have a growth mindset. There's a reason that you're here. I ask that no matter where you are at in your journey, you think of small incremental ways you can make progress in terms of uh, wherever you're trying to end up and aligning with social equity advocacy efforts. We won't get to all the things and that's okay. This might be agreement that's more for me since when I'm talking about a, a topic I'm passionate about, obviously I have a tendency to wanna go in deep um, and I, I'm, I'm sure many of you will likely feel the same with some of the things we'll be talking about, but I think it's important to note we won't get to all the things, but with that, follow up with me. So my email's on the screen, I'll be sharing it again later. You can find me on LinkedIn. Let's connect, continue the conversation. Um, and so with that, let's go ahead and get started. All right. so. What is social equity? I first wanted to pull a definition that was shared with me from the Michigan Marijuana Regulatory Agency, which defines the purpose of its social equity program as promoting and encouraging participation in the marijuana industry by people from communities that have been disproportionately impacted by marijuana prohibition and enforcement to positively impact those communities. So. A number of things in this definition I notice and jump out to me, I would ask you to kind of look to see the same with regard to some of the intention behind how they've defined their social equity program, who it centers. And I think in, you can see here, I, I called out positively impact and that positively impact for who are these communities that have been disproportionately impacted by the legacy of cannabis, right? Marijuana prohibition and enforcement, which we'll look more at. So I do have this question though of where does justice fit in to this definition? And so when I asked myself this question, I went to find two crucial definitions of justice that are really imperative to understand should we be uh, really centering justice in our social equity advocacy efforts. And those two terms are social justice and restorative justice, each of which I want to define with you so we can ground in some shared language. So first, social justice. This is a term taken from the Center for the Study of Social Pro uh, Policy, which defines social justice first and foremost as a process. It is a process, not an outcome, which seeks fair re redistribution of resources, opportunities, and responsibilities, challenges the roots of oppression and injustice, empowers all people to exercise self-determination and realize their full potential, and builds solidarity socially and community capacity for collaborative action. So, Again, I kind of bolded some of the things here that really jump out to me at this about this definition. First and foremost, that it's a process, which I think is something that translates as we think about social equity advocacy. It's not something that we're just going to one day reach and say, okay, we're done with this. No, this is something that we are going to continuously invest in undertaking as we seek to fairly redistribute resources, opportunities, and responsibilities. And two jumps out to me as well, right? Challenging the roots. What actually created the injustice in the first place? What created um, those negative impacts that we just saw on the on, on the last slide that the uh, state of Michigan ha has centered in their social equity program? Um, and so, what are those what are those root causes that we're actually challenging? How are we empowering people to exercise their own self determination? And how are we building capacity uh, and building social solidarity that allows communities that maybe were previously harmed? to restore themselves, right? To have the resources within, uh, to not be dependent on any external source uh, to provide the, the healing and restoration needed. 
uh, to overcome uh, obstacle or adversity. Next, you have this definition of restorative justice, which is from the Restorative Justice Mediation Program that defines restorative justice as a theory of justice that emphasizes repairing the harm caused or revealed. It is best accomplished through cooperative processes that all include that include all stakeholders. So I think this one is especially important when we talk about cannabis, and we'll get into why that is. But specifically, this idea that we need to repair the harm caused is something that I think anyone who is in any way, shape, or form involved in the cannabis industry knows we have to center, right? The legacy of this industry is rooted and steeped in harm, which we'll talk about. And so when we when we say restorative justice needs to be centered in our social equity advocacy efforts, we mean this action of repairing the harm uh, that was caused in, in the past by the same plant. So social justice and restorative justice. My proposal to you is that to advance social equity, we must center justice for disproportionately impacted communities. We're gonna be circling back to the definition for these two terms because I think they're imperative and crucial for us to understand if we really, really are aligned with how we're talking about social equity advocacy. We're investing in a process for disproportionately impacted communities to restore that, that harm done, to uh, challenge those root causes of the, uh, the systemic failings in the first place, creating and building capacity within those communities. And so with those two just those with those two justice definitions, that allows us to have an informed definition of social equity that can uh, then guide and lead our efforts as we organize with community members and with ourselves around how do we actually achieve that vision. So I want to now get into some of that legacy. And what we know about the legacy of cannabis in the United States is it's deeply tied to harm. And that harm was mostly caused by racism, oppression, oppression, and systemic failure. And so communities that are disproportionately impacted are those that receive the brunt of this harm, which we'll look at, and are still healing from that harm caused and the trauma that's then created uh, when the space is not given to uh, meaningfully uh, provide restorative space to heal from that harm. So first we can look here at some slides on the war on drugs and the criminalization of cannabis. So this is a rough timeline that we can kind of see this journey of cannabis being criminalized and used to fuel and funnel uh, much of the negative impacts of the war on drugs. So first, 1980 to 1997, we saw the number of people incarcerated for non-violent drug offenses increase from 50,000 to 400,000. In 2007, we saw that the average Black defendant that was convicted of a drug offense would serve nearly the same amount of time as a white defendant for a violent crime. In 2010, we saw that of arrests for can of arrests um, of all drug arrests, cannabis made up 52% of those. So again, what is really driving this increase in the incarceration of nonviolent drug offenses? It's clear cannabis is a huge, huge playing a huge, huge role here. And finally, in 2018, we we get this report from the ACLU, which really shows with with kind of uh, stark and clarity that Black people in the U.S. were disproportionately impacted. And in this case, looking at more likely to be arrested, Black people in the U.S. were 3.6 times more likely to be arrested than white people despite similar usage rates. So we really see that the war on drugs is a war in many ways on people and on communities. And those communities are targeted in a very specific way. And so what we really see are these disproportionate impacts of marijuana arrest on black and brown communities. You can look here and see it in the state of Michigan in 2018, folks were 3.6 times more likely to be arrested for marijuana possession, about aligned with the U.S. average. You can see some outliers here in Montana. Black people were 9.6 times more likely to be arrested in Colorado on the lower side, 1.5 times uh, less likely to be arrested. So we can see some of the impacts of the legalization of cannabis and how it can lead to, in states like Colorado, uh, uh, lowering of the disproportionality compared to other states in that same region. But still, we see that um, Black people in Colorado, like every other state, are disproportionately more likely to be arrested for marijuana. And in Michigan, we have some kind of extreme outliers. You can see Clinton County, 21.5 times more likely if you are in Clinton County, Michigan, and Black to be arrested for marijuana possession um, and Great Seal County 1.3 times on the other side of that. So again, we see the disproportionate impact of these arrests. Um, and I, I'm kind of curious to hear from you all, what do you think, uh, true or false, Washtenaw County, the county that we're 
uh, currently uh, here on behalf of, thanks to the Washtenaw County of, Depart uh, of Public Health. Uh, what do you think? Are the outcomes in Washtenaw County better than or equal to the state and national average of 3.6 uh, times in uh, racial disparities in marijuana arrests? We got some people jumping in the chat. Um, I see some initial false. Uh, any other thoughts for better than or equal to? Okay. Got some hopefuls. Okay. Equal. All right. Well, let's see. The data says false. Washtenaw County, 4.7 times more likely. If you are a Black in Washtenaw County, you are 4.7 times more likely to be arrested for marijuana possession than white people, more than both the state and national average. So this makes to us very clear, right, that the legacy of cannabis, this is data from 2018, and we know the situation has been improving in terms of uh, cannabis policing and over-policing in Black and Brown communities in, since previous decades. So this is getting better right? This is better. We're looking at 4.7 times. And so what that says for us is that this legacy, again, is deep, deeply connected to um, race with regard to who uh, was what received the most harm uh, via arrest in the data that we're looking at right now um, as it relates to the legacy of cannabis. So again, we see this relationship as cannabis drives mass incarceration based on race, zip code, and identity. That racial profiling over-policing in Black and brown communities leads to higher arrest, leading to higher incarceration rates. We ultimately see over sentencing, like we looked at, where nonviolent drug offenders who are black are likely to serve the same amount of time as violent offenders who are white. And we ultimately see higher recidivism rate um, among uh, these folks who are incarcerated for cannabis. So look at this negative cycle that is just um, that is just the reality of the legacy of this industry that now we're all very excited about. And so how do we move with intentionality with, and, and, but at, and at the same time, really hold ourselves accountable for the legacy of the industry that we're a part of? So one of the things that this is connected to is trauma, right? We know that harm when uh, when especially when exposed when individuals are exposed to harm, it results in trauma. And so here's a definition of trauma: the results from exposure to an incident or series of events that are emotionally disturbing, physically harmful, and or life threatening, with lasting adverse effects on the individual's functioning and mental, physical, social, emotional, and or spiritual well-being. The conversation around trauma and trauma-informed care is one that I've been following closely over the last. A few years since my time as a classroom teacher, where again we saw the importance of leading with uh, and an understanding of the the way that trauma has impacted communities that are reeling from the impacts of systemic failures, much of which we've just seen when we look at data related to mass incarceration, the war on drugs, and criminalization of cannabis. So, when we talk about the criminalization in, in, of cannabis in particular, we know that it, those who are disproportionately impacted by the harm done are now over uh, impacted by trauma. And that impacts related to the person who's directly incarcerated, the impact on the children of the incarcerated parents, and the impact on the families and communities that are reeling from the loss of that incarcerated person. So we have to talk about this trauma and much of which we have not been able to for a myriad of reasons. And because of that, it continues to result in, in, in long-term effects. So for the individual, we know that the effects of trauma can lead to severe and chronic behavior and mental health conditions, that traumatic events in childhood are more likely to result in chronic health conditions later on in life, and that these create challenges in relationships, careers, and other aspects of life, uh, impacting an individuals' ability to live a life that is healthy, connected, um, and, and, and prosperous. And then we also know that the impacts of trauma exist at the collective level as well. They lead to a loss of trust in institutions that ultimately played a role in causing this trauma, who oftentimes are extremely hesitant to even acknowledge the role they played or hold themselves accountable uh, to the role that they played in creating that trauma. It ultimately has resulted in strong negative cannabis stigma within disproportionately impacted communities, that there's a lasting stigma around cannabis use and users, that the the, the, the realities that they were disproportionately involved in the justice system has now led to mindsets and myths that still plague the cannabis industry and how we talk about cannabis today. And then ultimately, we know that there is a mental health crisis occurring within our society that's resulting from toxic stress, the reality that there are a lot of adverse childhood experiences that are causing trauma occurring, and then violence at, at the highest levels of our society. So 
I'm going to turn now to look at uh, some of the present data around participation and the benefits of the medicinal cannabis industry. So shifting now from looking at the legacy of cannabis and historical ana analysis to now looking at data on the present day reality of those who are actually accessing opportunities being created by medicinal cannabis. And what we see very quickly is that disproportionately impacted communities, the communities that we just talked about were most harmed by the war on cannabis and the war on drugs are now underrepresented in participation in the benefits of legalization. So first we can look at Michigan ownership interest by race. So this is uh, data from 2020, which looks at uh, ownership interest of cannabis businesses from the um, from the MRA, um, which found that 3.8% of, of Black cannabis business owners or cannabis business owners were Black, which correlates to 14.1% of population, 1.5% of cannabis business owners were Hispanic or Latino, um, which is much less than 5.3% of the population. We also see that there are, that gender, right, leads to um, underrepresentation in this space, specifically female minority cannabis industry executives, are, are, are much, much less likely or much more less likely to encounter glass ceilings as it relates to being in the aspects of the cannabis industry that are most associated with growth and economic opportunity, right? So why, when we look at these vertically integrated MMJ businesses and recreational businesses, do we see the percentage of executive positions filled by female minority executives dropping drastically? Here's another breakdown of marijuana business owners and founders by race and business type. Again, we see that the communities, uh, Hispanic communities, African-American communities, black and brown communities that were disproportionately impacted now have some of the lowest rates in the industry and are much more, le much more likely to be represented in ancillary sides, which is great, but we know that plant touching sides of the industry um, have uh, significant cash flow and wealth building opportunities. So we need to talk about why what dynamics in the industry are resulting in these groups to be underrepresented? Some more data. This is some updated data from June of 2022, looking at a snapshot of demographics of Michigan's medical cannabis industry license holders. You can see here the breakdowns playing on what we just looked at, right? Gender and race are key determining factors of the likelihood of you participating in this industry. And the same is seen on the adult use side uh, of the industry. So we really see black and brown communities and black and brown women, especially underrepresented when we talk about economic opportunities, ownership opportunities being created by cannabis. We also see underrepresentation in medical cannabis programs, which isn't too surprising. Here's a quote which shares like findings in which black patients have less access than white patients to advances in healthcare have been documented repeatedly across numerous medical conditions. So as we see medical cannabis being used and folks innovating around the use of medical cannabis to uh, um, provide relief around different medical conditions, we see that black patients and uh, patients of color, low income patients are much more or less likely to participate in the medical cannabis program. And so this has been seen in studies in New York, which found that medical cannabis services are least available in neighborhoods with black residents and most available in urban neighborhoods with highly educated residents and in Florida, where emerging evidence shows that minorities are underrepresented as medical cannabis patients. So we do need some more data to look at the dynamics that are specifically exist within uh, Michigan, which is one of my call to actions later in the slide, is how do we get more research to know, again, at the local level, what are these, what are, where, where are those disproportionately impacted communities underrepresented? Um, but this likely we we can we can make some uh, trans transfer we can understand that these dynamics that result in these and the root causes of these are transferable across states. So again, related to the reality that that black patients have less access to white patients in advances to healthcare, that translates as we see medical cannabis be an, a, a, an advancement in in folks of being being able to address symptoms of medical conditions uh, through cannabis usage. Okay, so again, this is that key takeaway that in 2022, disproportionately impacted communities are significantly underrepresented among those accessing benefits of cannabis legalization. That is a problem we must address. So some key takeaways for our social equity efforts. We know the legacy of cannabis is deeply tied to harm caused by racism and, and systemic failures. We know that historical data shows clear relationship between race and likelihood of being impacted by cannabis arrest. We know in 2022 that if you are under that if you are underrepresented in the cannabis industry, you're likely to come from a disproportionately impacted community. 
And we know that social equity advocacy must be a process that we undertake to advance justice and restore harm done to communities disproportionately impacted by the legacy of cannabis and the harm caused by cannabis policing, criminalization, and prohibition. So moving into the, before we move into the next section of our webinar, I would love for folks to jump into uh, the chat. So in one word, what is your reaction to the data presented on historical context and current industry dynamics in cannabis? So asking to take a moment, check in with yourself, one word to describe kind of your reaction to the data presented on the historical context and current industry dynamics. How are you feeling about what's been shared so far? Concerning, surprising, sad. Yeah, thanks for engaging in the chat, y'all. Uh, validating, okay, so maybe we're undertaking some efforts to, to really center these disproportionately impacted communities, right? We can look at this data and it tells the story very clearly for us. And so much of our time as we move into community and as we move into solution, shouldn't be much into the why behind the importance of centering the voice to disproportionately impacted communities. The data tells that story for us, right? It should focus on how are we actually allowing those folks to lead um, efforts to restore harm done and advance justice. So let's move now into the next portion of uh, this webinar, the second portion where we actually look at some examples of advocating for social equity through medicinal cannabis. And so again, just to ground us in some language that is gonna inform our definition of social equity advocacy. So these two definitions of justice, which I'm inviting us to center as we talk about social equity advocacy. The first, social justice. Again, how, when we think about strategies to advance social equity, are we thinking of it as a process, not an outcome? which seeks fair redistribution of resources, opportunities, and responsibilities, that challenges the roots of oppression and injustice, that empowers all people to exercise self-determination and realize their full potential, and builds social solidarity and community capacity for collaborative action. How do our social equity efforts reflect that definition? And then restorative justice, again, a theory of justice that emphasizes repairing the harm caused or revealed, best accomplished through cooperative processes that include all stakeholders involved in the harm that was caused. So as we think of these two definitions of justice being central to our social equity advocacy efforts, we can move into some proposed strategies for advancing social equity efforts through medicinal cannabis. So in this next section, I'm gonna look at some proposed strategies, look at some considerations within those strategies, look at some examples and some exemplars of organizations or initiatives that are truly working to advance social equity in these different strategy areas. And then we'll also look at some of the barriers that are ultimately preventing us from making sure that we can have the greatest positive impact possible on disproportionately impacted communities through these strategies. So the first is healing and wellness. How are we creating restorative space for disproportionately impacted communities to heal and build sustaining wellness? Two, economic opportunity. How are wealth generation opportunities being provided to disproportionately impacted communities? And three, reinvestment. How are cannabis revenues being invested to advance justice in disproportionately impacted communities? These are proposed strategies here. So what I am inviting as we move into this next section is your thoughts um, and would love to, again, bring the wisdom that is in the room into this space with regard to how you know your local context and what are some of the strategies that you've seen work with regard to centering disproportionately impacted communities and advancing justice within them. So I'm going to invite you all to constantly be thinking about opportunities where you can chime in and share examples of things that are working or barriers you're encountering as you move to understand the root causes of these dynamics that we just looked at that relate to the historical and present realities uh, within the cannabis industry. So first up, let's look at healing and wellness. Again, how are we creating restorative space for disproportionately impacted communities to heal and build sustaining that wellness? The first slide I have here might be a bit of a curveball, but I think it's important that we center in it, which is expungement and record clearing. We really cannot talk about healing and wellness if we do not talk about recognizing the incredible harm done to those directly impacted by cannabis arrest, incarceration, and the records that were created around cannabis-related in interactions with law enforcement. So we know that millions of criminal records were created. We know the reality that criminal records stick with people long after they serve their time and impacts their ability to rent housing, access public assistance, secure a job. 
And so we know that some expungements uh, have been happening in the state of Michigan and expungements direct the court to treat a criminal conviction as if it never occurred, ideally removing it from an individual's public record. But we need to make sure that we're centering our resources around individuals that were impacted by records that were created uh, pertaining to cannabis and the criminalization of cannabis. So we've, we have seen some great initiatives in Michigan, like Project Clean Slate, which is a, a Detroit initiative to help records get their criminal records, get, help residents get their criminal records expunged. You can also email the CIEU, the Conviction Integrity and Expungement Unit in the Washtenaw Department of, uh, uh, in the Washtenaw County Government. Um, so there are resources available for folks that are um, helping people clear their records, but it's important that we be active with our outreach and making sure that these individuals have access to those advances in healthcare, those economic opportunities. And much of that starts by making sure that they don't have a record looming over them that's potentially going to impact their ability to even access those resources or services. So when we talk about healing and wellness, we have to just talk about acknowledging that individuals were wrongly incarcerated wrongly impacted by records, make sure those records aren't still looming over them so that they can actually ac access uh, resources that can help them move forward and achieve healing and wellness. The next I'll look at here, uh -oh, excuse me, um, is increasing access to healing and wellness through cannabis. So what this slide shows here is again, this idea that cannabis has incredible healing properties. Um, under this graphic, I'm not sure what happened here, uh, with my formatting, but you can see that 7.28% of those who are qualifying patients in the state of Michigan are for or list PTSD as a use. So people are already using cannabis to address symptoms of trauma. And PTSD is a great example of that. We'll have another conversation as a part of this webinar series with an individual who's talking about specifically veterans access to cannabis and how cannabis can be used to treat PTSD. So it's important to understand that Cannabis, medicinal cannabis can be utilized to address symptoms of trauma and address some of the, the realities of different medical conditions and the ways folks address the symptoms needed to then get deep into addressing the roots of what's causing those medical conditions, whether that's trauma or some other medical concern. And then this other uh, statistic here lists how the positive impacts of cannabis are seen on medical cannabis patients who utilize it with pain and how it leads to positive impacts on health-related quality of life. So we see cannabis working with regard to improving quality of life and addressing symptoms of trauma. But the reality is we have some real barriers that exist that are ultimately resulting in low participation rates in medicinal cannabis use, some of which we saw earlier on, right, when we looked at that slide that showed that Black people were less likely to have access to advances in healthcare and some data from other states that showed Black and brown folks were less likely to participate in medicinal cannabis industries. So some of the barriers that we've identified are root causes of low participation rates are first, the stigma surrounding cannabis, right? We have many folks who are in disproportionately impacted communities who still carry this I don't smoke weed mindset with pride. And that's great if you don't smoke weed, but you still have to be open to considering other methods of consumption, other ways that medicinal cannabis, whether through medicinal cannabinoids or terpenes or other aspects, medicinal properties within the cannabis plant are being utilized to uh, actually, to, to help those in any individual address uh, symptoms of uh, any medical condition or just be able to improve their quality of life. So we see a lot of the folks just opting out of being able to access this plant because of these stigmas that ultimately are tied to the legacy that individuals have with their personal relationship with cannabis, whether that's examples of them uh, uh, seeing cannabis used or, or using cannabis and having uncomfortable experiences or false myths they hold around the impacts of cannabis on, um, on an individual, maybe that lazy cannabis user stigma or those worries about public safety when we know cannabis doesn't lead to increases in adolescent consumption, right? We know um, that we can be proactive about addressing uh, issues of, of driving under the influence um, as it relates to cannabis legalization. So we have to make sure that these false myths that we're proactive about addressing them and have plans in place so that we can bring people into the fold through our education and outreach efforts to have mindsets that at least allow them to consider cannabis and cannabis usage as something that can help improve their quality of life.
We also know that limited access is a concern, right? That the cost of average retail flower price um, for medical uh, cannabis uh, an ounce is about $112 in the state of Michigan. It's much, much higher in other states. So state of Michigan relatively is doing a good job, but there are still tremendous cost barriers to participating in the medical cannabis in uh, medical cannabis program, especially because we know that insurance many times is not covering uh, medicinal cannabis use, especially not federal insurance, right? Which we know that many folks who are in under-resourced communities uh, might be taking um, or participating in, right? So how are we making sure that cost to actually just purchase flour is not a barrier? And then distance. Who are those who are certifying individuals for medical cannabis? Are they in federally qualified health centers, right, which disproportionately serve as under-resourced communities? And where are the dispensaries that are providing access to these medical cannabis products? Is distance a big barrier? Are these, um, are these access points within a community institutions or led by community members that are trusted by these disproportionately impacted communities and not just by some outsider? Um, so this, this issue of access is one that is a huge barrier. And then finally, lack of outreach, education, and research. Are outreach, education, and research efforts led by trusted members of disproportionately impacted community? Much of times, we see things being led on behalf of, not in partnership with, or not centering disproportionately impacted community, but doing things with, that, with those ivory tower solutions, right? Thinking of things and solutions in, in environments that are far removed from those that are actually dealing with the impacts of the realities of, of the trauma caused by the legacy of cannabis or the reality of um, the, the underrepresentation of, of my community in the cannabis industry. And that the efforts to address those, the strategies to invest those, in, uh, address those are not actually being led um, in meaningful ways by those community members themselves, or at least not trusted members of that community. So these are key barriers that we have to address in order to um, increase participation rates uh, among disproportionately impacted communities in the medicinal cannabis community. Some other exemplars of healing and wellness efforts that I'll, I'll spotlight, we have Midwest Canna Nurses, which is based um, in, in Michigan, a great organization led by registered nurses op operating to offer um, consulting services that help cannabis and the healthcare uh, connect by offering educational resources, encouraging informed consumption, and developing individualized care plans for holistic treatment. So this is just an example of an organization that is really leading to make sure that health provi healthcare providers are, are in proximity with disproportionately impacted communities so that they're delivering the education needed and the tailored supports needed to appropriately participate in consumption and benefit from medical cannabis. There's a magic, med, marijuana education mandate, which is a continuing education initiative in the state of Michigan, where it encourages uh, public health code professionals to invest in cannabis studies, some of that which is provided by the state to understand existing pain and symptom management requirements. So this is that idea, again, of capacity building, right? That are we making sure that our medical providers have the, the skills, have the knowledge and resources they need? to be able to appropriately connect those who access them for medical services with cannabis when it is appropriate for the conditions or symptoms that they're dealing with. There's the Doctors for Cannabis Regulation, which is creating space for physicians and other health professionals to share in education and advocacy efforts. And then there's the Healing Justice Project, which is a non-cannabis related initiative, but that incorporates the interrelated and, imp and imperative concepts of healing and justice to address the widespread harm caused by systemic failures that result in wrongful convictions. So there's a lot to be learned from the Healing Justice Project with how it centers both the need for healing in creative restorative space, but also the need to address the systems, the institutions that ultimately created the injustices and caused the harm in the first place. And then I also love this example of the Wraparound Resource Fair, which is from the Cannabis Equity Illinois Coalition um, in, based in Illinois, uh, which is just around how are we making sure that we're providing holistic access to resources uh, that can help individuals live well, healthy lives, right? Beyond just those that are directly related to physical health or emotional health, broadly addressing those social determinants of health that we know contribute to um, disproportionately impacted communities, really being able to thrive and um, restore that harm done. So next we'll go to economic opportunity. So what are opportunities for disproportionately impacted communities to improve financial health and build wealth 
through medicinal cannabis. So access to economic opportunity being created by medicinal cannabis. First, it's important that we understand that there's a key and important relationship between financial health and health outcomes. That financial health, understood as one's ability to manage expenses, prepare for, and recover from financial shocks, have minimal debt, and ability to build wealth underlies all facets of daily living, as, um, such as securing food and paying for housing, and is one of those key things that can ultimately influence an individual's health outcome. So there is a relationship directly between the economic opportunity being created, the ability of that economic opportunity to uh, build sustainable financial health in disproportionately impacted communities, and that are ultimately leading to improved health outcomes in those same spaces. To look at just the market size, Michigan's cannabis sales to date as of June 2022, these numbers here, y'all, are, are billions. So uh, sales to date of medical cannabis by as of June 30th, uh, $1.4 billion and adult use cannabis, cannabis $2.7 billion of sales to date. So there's real market opportunity here, a multi-billion dollar market just in the state of Michigan. And this is only in the first few years of legalization. So we know that there is much money, many, many, many more cannabis products to be sold, much more growth to be seen. And so when we talk about opportunities, what types of opportunities are available? So there's ownership opportunities to actually own some of these licenses, own the businesses being created. There's employment opportunities to work within those spaces. And there are procurement opportunities, right? To, the, to support the businesses that are those license holders and support this industry at large as they spend for different support needs that they may have and different supply needs that they may have. So how are we creating access to these economic opportunities in disproportionately impacted communities through our social equity advocacy efforts? There are some key barriers to economic opportunity in making these opportunities accessible. One is access to capital. The state of Michigan actually had a great proposed program that came from um, their, the Racial Equity Advisory Board that supports the Cannabis Regula Regulation Authority that was all about providing uh, micro grants and, and access to crowdfunding platforms. But because of legal hurdles, those didn't pan out. So again, in, in the state of Michigan, how are folks who are maybe leading micro enterprises who maybe don't have the credit history needed to access traditional financial institutions who maybe don't have access to family and friends friend networks needed to get the seed capital to open doors to apply for that license how do they have access to the capital needed to put the uh, put that skin in the game that's often needed to get a new license or open a business we also know that exclusion of legacy operators is happening and is le legislatively allowed, right? Especially those with records who are not able to participate um, in, for, in Illinois, for example, in the hemp industry or in the cannabis industry, or are the, uh, those with records are being reviewed on a per case basis for if their badging is, is, is approved. So there is real exclusion of legacy operators um, and those with criminal records in the cannabis industry being able to access these economic opportunities. We also know the quality of these career opportunities available is, what, is a barrier um, and the ability of workers to advocate for themselves through uni unionizing, for example, is, is something that we have seen a lot of pushback with from the cannabis industry to date. So are these opportunities that we're preparing people for in this cannabis industry when it comes to employment, quality career opportunities? Are, those, are they opportunities that actually allow people to build financial health? Because we know that there is a reality of this country of a lot of employment opportunities actually not putting uh, individuals in positions where they are building financial health, but putting them in positions where they have to work two or three jobs or figure out health care on their own. So are we, really, are we really creating quality career opportunities for folks to step into? And then the legality of social equity provisions. Remember that as we pass policy at the municipal, county, or state level, or federal level, that they have to be legally defensible. Here's an article from Politico that uh, spots, spotlights the leader here of a cannabis business association uh, for uh, Black operators in Detroit. Um, and this article spotlights the unintended consequences of trying to give Black marijuana entrepreneurs a head start. It reads, the city's efforts to create a cannabis industry that mirrors and benefits its majority Black population has led to lawsuits, a collapsing market. Meanwhile, in other places in the state, the industry thrives. So as we pass policy and as we think of our idealistic approaches to it, um, centering social equity efforts in our policy, 
are they actually legally defensible within within with within the judi judicial system and ultimately are they going to stand up or is it just going to create dynamics that ultimately lead to folks getting a delayed start right we know in illinois that licenses were just released three years after uh, they were announced in the application process opened, right? What does that mean in terms of the head start that we're giving existing operators? And what are some of the unintended consequences of having that pro-social equity agenda baked into um, legislation as opposed to other opportunities there are to uh, have systems and accountability checks in place that can still make sure that black and brown marijuana entrepreneurs have a place in this industry, but in a way that's legally defensible. All right, so let's look at some more exemplars um, for uh, access to economic opportunity. There is the example of the social equity presentation tour, which is being done by the Michigan Cannabis Regulatory Agency with the goal of hosting three virtual sessions every two months. So this is a dynamic program to just make sure that application process is accessible and that, li uh, and that uh, licensees are accessible and sharing their experiences so folks can apply and be successful. There are some great supplier diversity initiatives going on from organizations like Women Grow and Minorities for Medical Marijuana to make sure that the cannabis industry is utilizing diverse suppliers. And then one of the things that we do um, and that I lead back in Illinois is just around cannabis community building through networking events, hiring events, community education. Are we doing the outreach necessary to increase awareness of these opportunities and actually make sure that resources human resources and human capital connections, as well as educational resources that are um, no cost, for example, are actually available and accessible to community members. So being very proactive about that uh, versus, versus retroactive. All right, and then our final strategy here, I gotta move through this quickly so I can make some adequate time for Q&A, is reinvestment. So how are cannabis revenues being invested to advance justice in disproportionately impacted communities? So reinvestment, again, this idea that the monies that are being created, the revenue that's being generated, how is it actually improving outcomes in disproportionately impacted communities? Who is deciding how those monies are allocated and how are disproportionately impacted communities centered in the decision-making process? We know that in the state of Michigan, specifically, there's a fund that's being created based on the excise tax of the adult use um, uh, cannabis tax. So the sales tax just goes, is allocated with the state state's budget in the same way that they allocate all other sales tax dollars, but that excise tax ha has created a whole fund that's just being distributed to counties, local governments, um, that disproportionately impacted communities need to be centered in with regard to decision-making around how those dollars are spent. And so there are a few relevant stakeholders here. One, there's a stakeholder that we often forget about for reinvestment, which is the business owner, right? That that business owner has a real incentive and a responsibility to reinvest in the community that they're now um, extracting cannabis wealth from and making sure that they're putting back in meaningful ways, reinvesting in that community as license holders. There's also local government, county and municipal governments that are making decisions about how tax dollars are spent. And then there are state departments that are being allocated funds that are also um, making decisions about how these cannabis revenues are being spent. So just to look at this a little bit more in depth, we can see kind of first on the left, how tax dollars in Michigan um, related to cannabis, adult use cannabis are being allocated. Uh, a percentage of that is going, or a, lot, a portion of that is going to the implementation, a portion of that is going to veteran marijuana research. And then this is where there's actually some flexible spending um, in, uh, uh, for municipalities and counties, which is that 15% of the annual fund um, is distributed to municipalities, 15% to counties. And this is again, where the state department is making some decisions, 35% of unallocated uh, uh, of the unallocated budget is going uh, from the fund is going to the school aid fund. Thirty five percent is going to the Michigan Transportation Fund. So, in twenty twenty one fiscal year, one hundred and seventy two dollars million dollars were available for distribution. Municipalities received twenty one million dollars, twenty one point one million dollars. Counties received the same. The school aid fund and the transportation fund received forty nine point three million dollars, respectively. So. We don't have too much control over how the school aid fund and transportation fund um, oversee their, 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 the, the, the allocation of those tax revenues, but we do have some insight into how municipalities and counties are doing that. So, for example, we can look at Washtenaw County. Um, Washtenaw County in from the 2021 fiscal year just recently was allocated $1.86 um, million dollars of um, cannabis tax revenue. The city of Ann Arbor received 
$51.1 million. The city of Northfield, $56,000. The city of um, the, or the township of Northfield and the city of Ypsilanti, I will try to pronounce that correctly, received $33,800. So who decides at these different levels? Uh, at the county level, the board of commissioners at Ann Arbor and the Northfield and Ypsilanti, it's either going to be the city council or the board of trustees. So again, this is where your vote, your local vote matters, right? The decision makers that you elect are ultimately making decisions about how these cannabis tax dollars fit into uh, the local local budgeting. So uh, again, some barriers here that we have to speak to. One is the limited community decision-making power on how tax dollars are allocated. Uh, for example, participatory budgeting um, is not something that's seen actively uh, much across the state. And there's also right, an incentive for our policymakers to address how the problems are manifesting at the surface rather than addressing the root causes of what may um, actually resulted in, uh, in whatever we're seeing at that community level. So again, we are really trying to think when we think about re a reinvestment, not at change at the surface level, but deep change, transformative change, change that really results in renewal. Um, and so there are some great uh, exemplars. The Washtenaw County in 2021, when they allocated their spending and uh, allocated the entirety of it to build capacity of the Racial Equity Office. There's the Restore, Renew, Reinvest Fund, which is a grant fund in Illinois that's solely allocating uh, tax dollars to disproportionately impacted communities. Um, there's a Social Equity All-Stars program that's inviting businesses who are license holders to name their social equity plans and have some level of public accountability around corporate spend. And there's also some unique things coming out of the city of Grand Rapids around participatory budgeting projects. And I'm curi curious and keen to see how the lessons learned from that are adopted by other governments to uh, allocate cannabis tax dollars to communities that were disproportionately impacted by cannabis criminalization. So um, to close, I just wanna quickly speak to the role healthcare providers play. Um, this is a quote from an interview I did in 2021 as a part of the research I was doing for this presentation. Uh, from Baia Lee, who was a leader of the Midwest Can of Nurses, and they shared healthcare providers, this industry needs you. Um, and there's a number of reasons that healthcare providers are needed as change champions in this space. Uh, for one, patients have led much of this movement up to this point that providers actually need to catch up. So you can get involved in local organizing efforts around cannabis and social equity advocacy. And as you get involved and as you learn and as you build uh, collective power. You can advocate. You as a medical provider have a role with a unique amount of trust that can be leveraged um, to really make the case for how social equity is a stepping stone to achieve health equity, right? We can make the case that by achieving social equity, by advancing social equity advocacy efforts, we can improve the social determinants of health. We also know that medical providers have a much needed and underrepresented perspective in advocacy in the regulatory arena. This is another qu a quote from the interviews um, I did uh, with health pro healthcare providers in the medical cannabis industry. And they share that lawmakers are often making rules for medical cannabis without significant input from medical professionals. So your input is needed and it will be valued deeply um, as it's underrepresented in the policy arena. And then finally, we do need to address the bias toward pharmaceuticals that we know still exists within many healthcare providers that are ultimately incentivized not to become certifying, uh, certifying providers when it comes to being able to participate in the medical cannabis program because of the tremendous incentives that they receive to participate um, in the pharmaceutical industry. So I did drop here and I'm happy to share these some key questions for creating a shared vision. These are taking some for some, these are taken from some of the organizing work that we did here in Illinois, working with local governments to uh, involve can, can, cannabis business owners, bring cannabis business owners, community members, local government to a shared space and address some of these key questions that are needed to align on social equity efforts. And really through that shared vision, through that alignment, your role as an individual becomes much more niche, right? It then becomes how do I, not how do I advance these social equity advocacy efforts, but what is the part that I'm playing um, in the whole to get us closer to our shared vision uh, within our community. So happy to share more um, with these sh shared questions and, and visions here. Um, I do think these are some of the key questions that we have to align on at the community level in order to uh, meaningfully advance social equity efforts. So with that, I think it's important to end with just like social or social change starts with you, change starts with you, that individual by, by building your collect, but your awareness at the individual level 
thinking about the relationships you have with family and friends and those you interact with, your loved ones, and the community that you're a part of, that is, by first starting at the individual level, that is how we have the greatest societal impact possible. So with that, y'all, I would love to close out by just checking in. What is one way you would like to contribute to social equity efforts and social equity advocacy efforts through medicinal cannabis? Invite you to jump into the chat with one way that you're thinking about getting involved. Thank you all so much for your time today. I would love to connect with you. Again, my email is on the screen or you can find me on LinkedIn. Let's continue the conversation. Um, and with that, I think we can kick off Q&A. Uh, Washington County team, I apologize. I'm, I went a little bit long, but I'm happy to stay a little bit longer uh, to Q&A if time allows. Great. Thank you so much, Grant, for that fabulous presentation. Um, and you answered a lot of questions along the way, too, actually. Um, if you have any questions, please enter them into the Q&A now. Um, we do have one question, and this is from Carolyn. Are providers, like doctors, nurses, et cetera, well-equipped to discuss medicinal cannabis use? Mm -hmm. That's a great question, Carolyn. Um, so, hmm. Well-equipped, I think, is going to be based a little bit on who you talk to, right? Me as a cannabis educator, I'm going to say no. Um, I think that there's a lot more that needs to be done with regard to just understanding the basics of cannabis and understanding how to also, lead, also not only understand cannabis and what it's good for and the symptoms that it can help address, but also what are some of those stigmas that the folks you may be recommending cannabis to what are some of the stigmas that they're still working through that they have to address and that, that we as a medical provider have a role in making sure that they are addressing that are potentially pre preventing them from even seeing this as an opportunity? So that's that's one piece. Um, the second piece that comes to mind, Carolyn, with your question, I, again, just goes to that idea of capacity building, that there are some programs at the state level that are doing and leading initiatives to um, make sure that uh, those who are medical providers uh, have access to education. Um, so to participate in programs like that. But this is something that I think that the last consideration I'll throw out around this question is like, this is something that we have only scratched the surface of in terms of really understanding the research basis behind the medicinal impacts of cannabis. And so there's much, there's a lot of just ongoing learning that we have to invest in, uh, which is I think new uh, for a lot of, for a lot of old school providers that are just kind of set in, these are the resources I know and trust and go to and that I will rely on for my information um, and, and, and having to step out of that, um, tr just those traditional boundaries in order to really uh, have the, the information needed to discuss medicinal cannabis use with, with clients and patients. So that's my reactions to that question, Carolyn. I hope I addressed it um, in a few ways, but thanks for that question. Thank you. And then the next question from Stephanie is how can social workers help to destigmatize okay. marijuana? Social workers have a huge, huge, huge role to play. One with like just your proximity to community. I think you are likely going to be one of the individuals who has the deepest understanding of some of those stigmas that exist. And so utilizing that to be that medium that is relaying what those stigmas are with the community organizers that are locally working to increase collective understanding of cannabis, right? So really just communicating what are those stigmas to organizers so that they can begin to de design new programming that can address that. So that, that's one piece is, is actually being the, providing some of what you're learning around those stigmas um, as data into uh, the efforts that we utilize to lead community education initiatives. The second piece that comes to mind is just like, Again, knowing the basics, right? We can all know the fundamentals. I have a webinar that's live on, on my website that's just Cannabis 101, right? Do you, know, do you know the basics of cannabinoids? Do you know the basics of terpenes? Do you know how these come together to create strains and how those are offered in products that people consume? Do you also know, right, some of the economic opportunities being created? So you can connect people with these job opportunities that are being created as you think about making sure that the person that you're working with is well holistically. Um, and and has all of their needs met. Um, so those are some of the um, so those are some of the call to actions I might leave with social workers. Stephanie, I hope that's helpful. Great, thank you so much. Um, and that is the end of our questions. I did just want to share a couple of things, um, and and I'm going to 
put that in the chat too, is that we are continuing our Cannabis in Practice webinar series this week and next. The next webinar is entitled, It's Not a Problem, Addressing Adolescent Cannabis Use in Clinical Practice by John Hopper, MD. And that's on Thursday, August 4th. So this Thursday at noon Eastern time. And the registration link is there as well as how to access our main medical marijuana page. And we are so grateful for you all to attend today's webinar um, or that you attended today's webinar. And we have a brief evaluation form with the link in the chat as well. Um, and with that, just please join me in thanking Grant for his time, his knowledge, and his willingness to share with us today. So thank you so much.